Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. And now a moment for our sponsors. I want to highly recommend you get Acquisition Aficionado Magazine. Every month, Acquisition Aficionado Magazine brings you tactics for business buying and selling you won't find anywhere else. Learn firsthand from industry leaders who share their success stories, featuring in-depth interviews and stories from leading figures in the business acquisition industry. This multi-platform mobile magazine speaks to acquisition entrepreneurs wherever they are in the journey. And I want you to visit acquisitionaficionado.com today. Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today I'm here with Jonathan Wilson. He is the CEO and Chief Value Creator at Dove Value Creation. Thank you for being on the show today. Oh, thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah, listen, we're going to have a blast here. We were chatting before that, before the show a little bit. You've got a pretty cool background from some really high-end companies you work for in the mergers and acquisition space to a college degree that does not logically fit in. I always joke around like, hey, you were born and now you ended up on a show with about mergers and acquisitions. Could you fill out the gap in between? So uh, yeah. how did you get into the space, man? It's so funny. The chemical engineering degree, I have to say my junior year of college, I had this internship. And it was an engineering internship with a gas company. And I cried at the end of the internship. I said, this is not what I want to do. <laughs> but I had been in this major and I really was excited about it. And I called my brother. My brother was like, you know what? You can just stick, keep the major. You can always change your, you know, change your career later. I said, not bad. So then I got a job with Accenture okay. as, as an intern for them just before I graduated and uh, yeah, they gave me an offer and I started my career. Awesome. Awesome. That's funny is I, I wanted to get out of technical management. I didn't really know it quite yet. I knew I was going to, I hit a spot in my career in technical management where I either had to get a master's degree in MBA yeah. or learn how to play golf. And I just figured the MBA would be cheaper and faster because the golf just did not appeal to me. So I'm going through this, what I was going to do is MBA and technical management and I hit, get to the point where I get to my capstone courses and I realize I don't want to be in technology anymore. I'm just burned out. I hate computers. To me, I, I just want them to be a hammer. I want to open the lid, do what I need to do, shut the lid. It's a tool. I want to, I want to be done with them. If you knew my background, you'd understand that I was really into computers for a while. So I worked for the government for a while in computers. That said, I went to the counselor and said the same thing. Like, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. I think I'm going to quit. I'm not going to finish my master's. And she goes, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going to start something. Well, pick something else, right? So she was like, came down to economics or accounting or like marketing. And I was single at the time. And the marketing had these really attractive young ladies in it. I said, I'm going to go check out the marketing classes. At least I'll do it that. And I really enjoyed the classes. Those girls never gave me the time of the day. But I really enjoyed it. A lot of papers and a lot of presentations and stuff. But the, the fascination of why people do certain things like in, in technology, if something's broken, it's either the idiot that wrote the code or the guy sitting behind the keyboard. Right. And business and in, in marketing and other stuff, you can give everybody clear directions and stuff. And human psychology gets in the way and people just do random stuff. That's fascinating. Why but, people uh, buy is still a conundrum, believe it or not. After I got with Accenture, I ended up going to work for Countrywide Financial. I don't know if you ever Countrywide Financial, but the floor fell from under us. I was the VP of strategy for a wholesale lending group. That was probably not the right place to be <laughs> in 2008, but whatever, right. I ended up getting bought out by Bank of America. That was my first taste of M&A. Like I just right. had no concept of really, I mean, I had heard of it and I right. studied it, but not really been in it. So I started thinking, seeing how things work and I started to look at the emotions behind it. And just how it, just how it ticked. And that was when I sort of fell in love a little bit. Yeah. You uh, ended up from Deloitte for a little while or? So, yeah. So <laughs> I had convinced Make of America to move me out to the East Coast. And then a year later, I left to go work for Deloitte. <laughs> and I worked with them for about three and a half years. It was great. m and and strategy. Then much work for Grant Thornton for another two and a half years before I decided to go out on my own. I'm like, you know what? Let me just see what I can kill so I can 
eat what I kill, right? Uh, yeah. So, uh, but you got the background. A lot of the guys, they come into this advisor space because they sold one business or whatever. And then they, just because you've done something don't mean you could advise it. Just because you've been around something once or twice and seen it or taken a course in it doesn't mean you can teach it, right? And in the same respect, just because you've done something a hundred times doesn't mean you're a great teacher. So it's a unique skill set. But to be around what you are around and see it at that level, I mean, Deloitte and those guys, they typically do that mid-market, upper market, right? What was your focus yeah. when you were at these? So you're looking at $25 million deals and above. Oh, much higher than that. I worked on a deal that was a $3 billion deal. <laughs> so yeah. we're divesting a whole credit cards division. It's definitely a different ball game. It's like right now I'm working on a $10 million deal, which is very different, right? The reason yeah. I brought that up though is yes, it's different and there's similarities. There's a lot of lessons to learn that can be brought down from that multi-billion dollar deal that still need to be done in the 10 million that a lot of people might overlook, right? There's still some real valuable, I love interviewing people here all the time. Our market, our audience, they're buying SBA deals for 5 million and below. They're buying mid-market, maybe just above the SBA range. So 10, 15, $20 million deals, but they're not in that like real mid-market like the Deloitte's and stuff would be playing in. So to be honest, most of these guys, most of the guys listening here, you, your listeners out there, their goal is to buy it, run it for a few years and sell it to PE. So they're kind yeah. of running right underneath that private equity radar. Like what are they looking for and how do I get something I can take to their level so they can play that, the uh, multiple arbitrage, right? So I love that. Now I've worked on $2 million deals. I've worked on $10 million deals. I mean, it's definitely, I enjoy helping the smaller guy or gal in the world here. And that's something that I really focus on. From a from the things that you're thinking about, you really want to look at how the company is being managed, right? Because that culture is going to be key. I think if there's nothing else, you want to make sure it's a good fit with your organization. There's right. some nuances, obviously, in terms of what you look out for from a due diligence perspective, you know, what you're looking out from, from your own valuation perspective, et cetera. At the end of the day, though, it's going to boil down to people. So the name of your company is called Dub Value Creation. So it kind of leads into the question of, do you start with people when they're just thinking, okay, I might sell this in three or four years. I need to start working on how do I exit at where I want to exit? At what point do you guys step in? So I, I love that, right? that you brought that up. Yeah. So I, so yes, is a short answer to that. I love working with people who want to grow before they sell. So the idea is that maybe you got a valuation. You're like, Ooh, this is not what I wanted to do for my retirement. I need to figure out how I'm going to get more revenue. And some of that it's hard to grow organically sometimes. So the idea of just buying a smaller shop. And in adding that to your revenue and molding that in, in, into something that also can help you develop that one plus one equals three concept mm -hmm. is really valuable. So I actually have a program that's focused on that. And that's one of the things that we do in addition to, of course, helping people that are sell side. And... So you do a growth through acquisition model as part of your coaching or strategy creation and execution. Exactly right. So uh, I was also reading through your website. It looks like it's more than just like, here's a strategy. You actually help execute. You guys. Can I be honest action. for a minute? I yeah. hate my website. <laughs> hey. I literally probably will. By the time this airs, I may have changed it. I don't know. But yeah. Okay. I hate well. it. It's who I was at one point. It's, it's who right. the company was at one point, right? It's it. We'd start off being focused as management consultants, focused on, we wanted to be a smaller version of Deloitte. That was yeah. the goal. Well, that was short lived, right? Because really what we found out was that we're really good at strategy and M&A. And that really should be our focal point versus okay. I think our website just shows that we're good at everything, which is not, I mean, yes, we can do everything, and, but who wants to do everything, right? So, but, so yeah, we are focused very much on the M&A space and very much focus on strategy as well for some select clients. Yeah. But yeah, that's our focal point. So let's dive into a little bit. I come to you, I run a small business. I'm looking at maybe I want to sell it in three to five years, but I really know I'm not where I want to be. I'm open to the concept of buying other companies, integrating them in. Where do you have me look? Are we looking at our competitors? Are we looking at our product line, like suppliers, that type of stuff? What is your, like, what is your process to help them identify acquisition targets? 
the very first thing is to take a look at whatever their strategy is for the current year. And that should be a documented strategy. Most companies don't have documented strategic plans. And I think that's the very first part. And then we look at the gaps, right? So where are the areas where you really want to grow your company? And that's where you identify your target and strategically understand how many different acquisitions do you want to do? And what's the timing of those acquisitions? So you create that three-year roadmap, if you will. And then at the end of the day, you want to have a good sense of how do I know that I'm ready to exit? Or how do I know that I'm ready to consider being sold? You should have minimum criteria for your decision-making. And unless you just, you're not getting there, right? But ideally, you should be looking at the growth in your company and thinking about the how, the how to reach that. It's mm -hmm. just the little, like everything you do every day leads to a bigger picture, right? So that's my initial suggestion. So and that's my, that's how we work actually. Yep. So we come in, now we have a strategic plan. We know our weak points. Is there a way that you, do you guys help facilitate the outreach and like the contact? Yes, of these? absolutely. So we have tools that we use to, to do the outreach to various companies that if you have specific companies that you want to, that you want us to target, we will absolutely do a different strategy for that. There might be an initial marketing piece though for companies that aren't necessarily in your target group, but would be interested possibly in selling. So that's something that we look at. A lot of times it's not well advertised that someone's looking to sell, right? Because right. who wants to scare their employees? <laughs> who wants to who wants to create that that sense of and instability, right? So you really have to ask the question in the right mm -hmm. way. And then someone says, I have been thinking about that. Or, you know what, let me get back to you and they'll get back to you that maybe in a more yeah. private way. But yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So, and so now we've got our strategic plan. We're doing the outreach. We're starting to conversations. How do you, do you, where do you bring in other people? What do you guys like do as far as the process, right? There's the OI and the negotiation mm -hmm. and due diligence, all the different steps along there. You guys facilitate that, bring in outside help to do some of it. What's the process look like? Well, just because from a legal standpoint, you want to make sure that you're licensed in California, I think if you're going to do a piece of the transaction. So mm -hmm. for us, we have a business partner that we work with, m and Business Advisors. So we partner with them on making sure that from a deal perspective, the transaction is going smoothly. At mm -hmm. the same time, though, we are serving as m and Advisors throughout the entire process. So it's a little bit of both, right? So we're not just... We're not just doing the MA advisory, but we also want to make sure that we're guiding the transaction itself from the escrow standpoint. If there is an escrow, if there is negotiation around the dollars and cents, we want to make sure that we have all the right people at the table. We also advise them on working with a legal team. Okay. So we have recommendations around that. Also, in addition to that, strong partnerships, for example, with Bernstein, Bernstein Financial, so private wealth. That's yeah. something that we work with those individuals and help them make sure that they're not going to be taxed enormously on whatever they receive from a sell side. And then on the buy side perspective, we also want to make sure that they're getting the best bang for their buck as well, right? We want to make sure that we're looking at every single nuance. There's always something that a seller didn't really divulge, not necessarily because he was trying to hide something or she was trying to hide something, but maybe because they just didn't recognize it. Right. Or right. They didn't didn't know the process. That would be something that was important. Right. So that's how things work. I've interviewed a lot of people and here recently, there's been a lot of, I guess the key phrase lately is uncertainty, right? That's the most common thing to, to like, if we're not a recession. It is a recession. We're almost in depression, the economic <laughs> downturn, all these phrases. And the only thing that best sums it up is uncertainty. Right. Nobody's yeah. really sure what's happening in the market right now. What from date if you don't like what's going on, look wait until tomorrow it might change. Right. So what do you say to the business buyers and sellers out there? What do you what are you seeing? Should they be concerned? Should they stick to a plan and just work through it because it's gonna change? What's your gut feel on this? So I might be a little bit too glass half full, but 
I'm a strong believer that somebody wins in every single scenario, in every single market. There's somebody who's breaking in the box in every scenario. So no matter what the year is, no matter what you're facing, you need to find a way to hustle. It's up to you though, if you want to put that energy out there, right? If you want, if you want to put the energy into finding your, your win scenario. But I would say this is not the economy that it was in 2008, right? Where people were just trying to find out how they got their next meal. This is not the same scenario. I wouldn't be as, I wouldn't be as freaked out if I were a business owner that's considering being sold just because of the economy. There have to be other factors that, that you want to, that you want to look into. And on top of that too, like, again, go through your, what you're looking for truly. Is it that you're just ready to retire? Is it that you want to go and do something different? If it's one of those two reasons, sure, go for it. Is it because you're scared of the next few years? I mean, that's not the right reason. Right. A lot of people don't understand. It's like, like uh, I call it the used car syndrome, right? Where you think you want to sell your car, you're ready to trade it in. You go have it detailed and have it serviced and everything else. And then like you're driving it around. You're like, well, this ain't too bad. Why am I wanting to sell my car? Right. It, 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 so uh, funny story. I, I, think, with, I had a condo and I did that. <laughs> I was like, I was like fixing it up, get ready to sell it. And I was like, man, I really like this place. <laughs> right. So I think it happens with business owners sometimes, right? You go through all this, like getting the revenue up, getting yourself out of the mix of everything, get management to where it runs it without you. You play the game of like, can I go on vacation for a month and it's still there? How about two months? Right. And all of a sudden, now this thing can run better with, without you than it runs with you. And you start questioning, a lot of the business owners start questioning, okay, well, why am I selling it, right? Is it, do I need the exit for retirement? Now it's like, do I need the money for retirement? Do I need the, especially if you got a new project. I'm not a big believer in having a company off to the side and another company you're working on now because at some point you're going to need your 100% of your focus. So if you've got another project, I could see, like I've got this other thing over here, I probably ought to sell that one. But uh, if you're wanting to semi-retire or something, I could, I see a, I've seen more than one where I talked to an advisor, he's working with somebody to come back a year and a half later because he said, it's going to take a while to clean this up. And they're like, yeah, the guy doesn't want to sell it now. It's like, I get it. He, he's playing. He, he was wanting to sell because he wanted to retire and play golf more. Now his management team's running things. He only goes into the office one day a week on Friday to cut checks and check on stuff. He plays all the golf he wants, right? So it's where he wanted to get and he didn't have to sell it. Yeah, and that's the whole point, right? It's like, if you get your company to the place where you really want it to be, you're right. And it's making you, and it's allowing you to live the life that you want to live. Then you're right. There's probably... No reason to really sell. I actually don't always encourage people to sell. I, by how, from a business perspective, right? We, that's what we do. We work on people's m and but I think the first thing is just really ask the question of why do you want to sell? And they have to be selling for the right reasons. If they want to sell, like, like you were saying, if it's just like, I just need more time. It's like, okay, if we got you more time and you, and I'd like, to, I need some money for retirement. It's like, okay, if we got you more time and we got your money situated for retirement, would you want to be around this or would you want this to be would you want to be done with it right the how do you handle that's the reason i bring this up is the, the number mm -hmm. one thing i see in the market right now is that so many business owners tie their entire identity around their business that they don't yeah. know what they're going to do next and a lot of times that's what kills the deal the last second they go i can't sell it i don't know what i'm gonna do tomorrow right there's that last second reluctance and, and they'll never say that they'll say well he wanted my sign and I didn't want to give up the sign. Like there was actually a story of a vineyard where a guy was selling the vineyard and the buyer wanted this antique sign that was in the lobby and a friend had gave it to the owner and he thought he was taking it with him. And they, he, he claimed that's what he was like. I'm not selling it because he won't give up the idea that sign is part of the, the sale. When you talk to him later, he just didn't know what he wanted to do. Three months later, when I interviewed him, a couple of months later, he's like, that wasn't the real reason was I just didn't know what I was going to do the next day. Right. The sign, yeah. I eventually got rid of the sign. It's like the sign really yeah. wasn't that sticking point. So how do you deal with that in this process? Like you're working with these business owners that are acquiring stuff to grow. They have it in their mind. They're doing all this work with you to get to a certain valuation so they can have an exit. How do you handle preparing them mentally to, to what's next? The conversation. You help them work with a tax advisor right? is the big, is the best thing. And that's what I that's what I do because it'll help you think about your generational wealth that might, that you might have as a result of this exit. 
It also help you think through what kind of vacations are you going to be taking, help you really imagine what this looks like. Do you and your spouse, do you and your spouse like to do like beach vacations or mountain vacations? How much is that going to cost in 20 years? <laughs> right? You start help. They start picture. They start giving you different scenarios and you start picturing it. And man, I'm getting excited myself. I'm like, that sounds really nice. <laughs> That's you just explain where I live. I'm living, I live in the mountains. There's redwood forest in my front yard and I drive to the beach every day. When we get done with the podcast today, I'm going to the ocean. But uh, That's it's a winning scenario, you, man. Yeah, the problem is you're just like how expensive it's here. I went to the wife of the grocery store this morning before the podcast and loaf of bread was five five sixty five for a for a, I didn't realize how we were out of ketchup like nine nine seventy nine dollars and seventy five cents for a big thing of ketchup. I was like, I had oh that moment goodness. the other day too. So, like yeah, what so in the world here? It's like what? Yeah. And I asked the wife, I said, it's because we live in a resort area, a, a vacation destination in Northern California. Everybody else comes, like the town's small until the summer and the spring and everybody else comes up here during the weekends and stuff for vacation. So the population of this area quadruples every weekend. It's mostly Airbnbs and vacation rentals and on the river yeah. and on the ocean. So I just asked the wife, I said, is this because we are in a vacation area? Like if we drive into town, is it that much cheaper? It's like, no, that's just California. Everything here is more expensive. So I just, I, I don't know. I just think people are trying to take advantage of certain scenarios, but I mean, I there's know. some I, of that. There has to be some of that going on, right? Like there's corporate greed going on there too. Some, I think. Yeah. But that's hopefully what the inflation, what the, not inflation, but the interest rate changes have been squashing a little bit. So I'm happy at that 4.9% number <laughs> going towards the 2%. I, the more yeah. I look at it, I'm like, oh, okay, this is good. This is good. We're going the right direction. And so you're uh, located down by LA, right? West Hollywood, I think you seen on your profile. I, I'm in it. Yeah. I'm in LA County. I like LA. The, yeah. Right near San Monica, um, right near Beverly Hills. Yeah. What do you guys operate? I mean, like you, anything in California, anything in the United States, you guys do businesses outside of the state of California or because licensing requirements, you stay within certain realms or. What's your, so uh, when we first started, we did more of the integration and due diligence stuff, and we partnered with companies all over the country and some, and in some cases around the world. However, now we're doing more of a focus on all of California. In some cases, we do a double click on LA for outward outbound marketing, but all of California is really what our sweet spot is. And LA, just because I know LA. It's definitely. But LA is a heck of a city too. I mean, you, you could be busy all your life in LA and never, uh, never yeah. need to leave there. So, uh, and generally like, uh, in LA expands by the way to like San Bernardino County and Riverside yeah. and San Diego and Orange counties. I do get people yeah. from those areas as well, reaching out. Yeah. It's like yeah. around here. If you, somebody says, well, San Francisco, they're talking about the whole Bay area. Cause they're talking about everything. hundred oh, percent. They, they say San Francisco cause everybody knows that. But they, and Oakland, everybody has a bad image of Oakland, so they don't say Oakland or whatever, but that's just right around yeah. that. I mean, it's, it's everything's within about 15, 20 miles. Like, I'm 65 miles due north of San Francisco, so sometimes I go down there for meetings and stuff. But uh, I yeah. love that San Francisco is really, San Francisco is really only the southern part of Northern California, so no one really thinks about that. Yeah. It's very, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's its own environment. I worked there for a while. I worked on the 19th floor of one of the buildings in a tech startup. And just the difference between working in San Francisco and working 30 miles south in Redwood City or one of the other startup yeah. cities, totally different world, totally different world, yep. totally different vibe, cultures different. Yeah. Totally. So yep. I bet LA is yeah, the same way. It's got its own culture. Yeah. I did some work up there it's in San Mateo. Yeah. So actually one of the very first Project of Accenture was working with E Trade out of yep. their offices. And, and that was super fun. They, that was a Palo, great company, actually. Yep. They in Palo Alto or were they at? My father in law so was in a little Palo while. Alto, yeah. San Mateo, and they had an office yep. also in downtown San Francisco. So my father in law worked there for a little while. He actually delivered mail. He retired from his, he had a oh. photography studio. He had his own business, a photography studio and stuff. And he sold that in Palo Alto. And, oh. it, his wife at the time, my, my mother-in-law didn't want him hanging around the house too much. So she had him delivering mail at each tray. <laughs> so that's the reason I knew where that one was. Yeah. So. Everybody's role matters. Every company. I just, it's actually yeah. one thing I really started to learn more as I, as I dive into this, I'm like, 
everybody matters. I, I tell the story probably more than once on the show. Some of the guys are probably getting sick of it, but I talked to a guy who bought a company and one of the things, he, he, it was a merger type of thing. He owned a company, bought a second one. One of the first people he divested of or got rid of or fired or what you call it was the office manager. And the company literally fell apart in his hands. He didn't know that not only did she order the supplies, nobody there knew how to do a, a travel invoice or a expense report or anything on that. Everybody just turned everything to her. So they would turn all the receipts over to her. She'd do it for them. Like, uh, ordered all the supplies. Like nobody even knew how to get the supplies. They actually it was a tech company that built hardware mm -hmm. devices. Nobody even knew where to get the circuit board or anything that they used because she just she ordered everything. <laughs> yeah, I've I, well, it's interesting because I re I recently well I shouldn't say it's recent, but within the past year I've talked to a business owner who he was talking to he was talking about his employees, a couple of people that probably needed to go. <laughs> and I said, well, if you if you're going to give them an ultimatum, be prepared for right. the results of that, <laughs> right? right? So if they aren't right. there anymore. Just know it's not going to get done. And so be very strategic in terms of how you say things, right? So yeah. Always take the emotion out of that because sometimes, you, sometimes, and it happens to all of us. Sometimes your employees just get on your nerves that day. No, which is I've seen it. I mean, I think every entrepreneur I know of, I know guys that have, and even as VPs and directors of whole divisions of companies, they'll call me like, because they know I have a lot of experience in this, and they're friends, yeah. they're all military buddies and stuff. And, We'll get to talk and he'll talk about this toxic employee that works for him. I was like, why is he still around? I just can't fire him. I'm like, sure you can. <laughs> like, like there's like there's seven point something, almost eight billion people on the planet. There's nobody that knows how to do his job. And they, they just have it in their own mind. That's the only guy on the planet that does that job. I'm like, that's, that, that's just not true. Yeah. It's not possible. If they're needed or adding value somewhere else, then that's different. Yeah. But if yeah. they're just toxic, then they need to go. In fact, well, this... actually, in front of me, I actually have a sticky that reminds me of that reminds me of the hire slowly, fire fast mentality. Yep. <laughs> right. No, this guy was definitely on his way out the door. He's almost retirement age. Caused more problems. He knew his job, but he caused more dilemmas and drama than than anything else. Just constantly causing problems. But uh, when everything broke, he he's the one that they sent him to fix it. I was like. How long does it take for him to train somebody else to do what he does, right? So anyway, let's go back That's to fine. let's go back to this mergers and acquisitions process. We talked about having a strategic yeah. plan, picking a target, doing outreach. Do you guys do any inbound stuff, like formally announcing that a particular company is looking for acquisitions? Hey, we're looking for companies that do X, Y, Z. I don't see that go on very often. I'm curious if you guys do that. We can. I think it's more of a social thing. Uh, it's more of with our network. We talk. Mm -hmm. We have like. We have definitely different teasers that like sell side teaser, buy side teaser, right? So things like that. So people can know not every company that is looking to acquire wants to be out there as have their name on it on something. So the best solution is usually to kind of code that through a teaser, right? If you're interested in learning more, please contact. Yeah, yeah. Right. I understand why you wouldn't want to, people to know that you're for sale. All right. What's the thought press process like to not want others to know that you're looking to acquire competitors? Well, it's not just wanting others to know. It's not wanting the wrong people to know because you get all sorts of solicitation anyways in this marketplace. Okay. And to have that out there, like I'm looking to buy something. Oh, my grandmother used to have this shop. She had this neighbor that owns this thing that does that stuff. So let me get back. Right, right. Yeah, I get that. I get that to the point. I was just curious if it was more along the lines of competitive proprietary knowledge and stuff. So I actually was trying to buy a competitor in the, I, one of the many things I own. <laughs> I, I don't tell people, yeah. I, I, not too much. I, most of my stuff's web-based now, but I still own a pest control yeah. company in Oklahoma. And yeah. I wanted to acquire a local pest control company. I, I kid around. I call it my nepotism company. Everybody that works there is kind of related to me. So uh, that. And that's why I kept it and I still keep it. But I wanted to be, get a bigger one. It's too small. I was going to acquire a bigger one and mold them together and stuff. And halfway through this conversation with this company, they were like, I just don't know. I said, why? Well, well you're a smaller competitor. I know you can line up the money to buy us, but how do I know you're not just fishing for information to become more competitive with us? Right. So I thought maybe there was some of that inside of this, not wanting your competitors to 
say, yeah, I'm for sale just to get through partial of the due diligence, learn some of your trade secrets and then say, oh, by the way, I'm not interested in selling. Like, how do you avoid? How do you really know if somebody's in, in the game to sell and wanting to do something or in the game just to fish for information? So that's where I mean, in, it's tricky. The NDA is supposed to kind of serve as a little bit of if you're willing to sign an NDA that you're not going to do anything with information, then that usually squashes a little bit of that. At the end of the day, you don't always know, which is why you have to be cautious about what you tell people, right? If they're willing, if they're willing to ask you more questions and go into due diligence with you, with you then that's going to be a really forthcoming conversation. But early on, before due diligence, you have to be really careful about what you tell people. I've always been curious on the Indians. Like, yeah, it's, 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 like I know in some states, the non-competes are, not, are just not enforceable. Like in a lot of states are not enforceable. How enforceable is the NDA? If you think about it, though, if I'm a competitor of yours and we're actually talking about mergers, how am I not going to do... Like we're they're so if you're aligned close enough to somebody, it's how do you where's the where's that line where you only did that because you seen us doing that? Like no, it's been on our product roadmap for six years, right? So I question the power and enforceability of NDAs. I haven't done the research and figure out how many lawsuits were won based off of NDA disclosure during the mergers and acquisitions. I'm sure there's some. I bet there's some trade secrets out there that were defended and and won over it. But you're right. I mean. Lo- Loosely, I think on a high level, the NDAs are enforceable, but it's more of a message. I think it's more of a message saying, hey, I'm willing to, I'm willing to work with you in a way that I, I promise you that I'm not going to divulge information. And I think it's just more of a, it's kind of like a handshake, right, if you will. Okay. So I think there's just a respect that comes with it. And if the person chooses not to respect that, then that's on their character, right? And that's on the company's character. So, yeah. And I guess like with any other contract, it's they're only worth what you're willing to enforce. Right. Like trademarks and patents are only willing to are willing to are only valuable enough that you're willing to enforce them and actually go to court over them. So if you're not, if you're not, then they won't hold up. And if you are, maybe people leave you alone a little bit. So I got that. So now we're already kind of walked through this process a little bit. We've got (laughs) our strategic plan. We've actually we're out there doing our outsource. We've got NDA sign. Do you? How far through it do you go? One of the biggest, I'm going to jump to the end just to, do you help with the integration of these companies and actually making sure that the, how do you, the culture fit? That's where a lot of m and fought fail, we right? Can. A lot of m and yeah. getting a business to say yes. Yeah, getting a business to say yes and getting them to truly function well with inside your organization are two different things, right? Getting lawyers to agree on a set of documents and and money to exchange and wire transfers to happen, reasonably doable, right? Getting 65 people at the new company to operate within a new culture and a new set of rules and new managers and they're basically the get past and over their resistance to change. That takes some finesse. That is the fundamental difference between m advisory and consulting versus business broker. Right. right. Because th- that's the fundamental difference is that we aren't just focused on a transaction. We're focused on making sure it's the right fit. We're focused on making sure that you're able to look at the synergies that you might gain from this and what realizing that might look like if you're on the, if we're on the buy side, if it's on the sell side, you want to make sure that you're separating in the right way. Is an asset sell the right, really the most beneficial thing for you. There's so many different nuances, I think, from an advisory standpoint that we consider. So again, up front, we look at the strategy, right? So you think about the M&A strategy from a sell side or from a buy side perspective, you're really diving in. You're thinking about who do we want to target? Who do we want to buy us? And you're getting in there and thinking about what the timeline looks like, et cetera, and asking all the right questions. So so that is slightly different than someone who just says, I'm waiting till you say, yes, I want to sell. Cool. And then when you say, yes, I want to sell, then I will go find you buyers. Like that's not, to me, that's a very transactional focused relationship and that's fine. It still pays, <laughs> but I really care more about the client doing the right thing and making sure it's a fit for them and that they benefit in the long run. 
You brought up an important topic there. We've been talking the whole time about growth through acquisition and the acquiring process, but you talked about when you brought it up. Lisa, I think I heard you say when you sell, you got to do this too. And uh, I've only, out of 130 advisors, I've actually only had one that ever used the phrase. He called it reverse in integration. And what it was is he's like, when we go to sell, we typically know there's one of these five particular companies that are going to be one of the mm -hmm. acquirers, right? It's PE, these four PE firms, maybe it's, they identify maybe 10 targets. These four PE firms, this, these two or three strategic acquirers and potentially this class of, in our world, it could be this class of individual operator that wants it. What they typically did, what he was doing was like, okay, what systems and processes are common amongst them, right? That's right. So as we're getting ready to sell, if everybody, nobody's using QuickBooks but us and we need to move to zero or whatever, then I don't know what the other, I'm not an accountant guy. But if they're the ones to use, yeah, I'm with you. Fresh books, <laughs> peach tree. I'm going to date myself. <laughs> right. you know, yeah, one of those sites, right? They're using X and we're using Y, and all the majority of the big guys use X. Probably ought to start looking at, okay, instead of paying for that next year license of TurboTax or, or QuickBooks, let's start looking to move to what, you know, 85% of our acquirers use. That's what he was doing instead of this reverse integration is like looking at the market, what does the market use and making some of those changes now so you're more appealing, right? You That's exactly right. I mean, I think, I don't know if I would talk about like a big technology change always, but that's definitely something to look at. You want to look at your sell side writing this checklist, right? And I mm -hmm. think that's the big thing. And having that, what I call go, no go, epic <laughs> right decision. So on a regular basis, you're like, how much closer am I to achieving what I want to achieve for my exit? And I think that's the important part of that. And really having a routine around asking that question. That checklist, though, is very key. So that's going to be from a technology standpoint. That's going to be from a management team standpoint, from a customer standpoint. For example, we want to make sure that you as the owner, if you're not looking to stay with the company for too long after, after the company is bought, you want to make sure that your customers are very familiar with your management team and not as familiar with you, right? So if you know every single name of every single customer, then you're not ready to sell. So, Right. I actually talked to a, a business owner. He took five years. He took five years to get himself ready to sell. I said, why five years? He goes, I don't, have, there's not a single customer in our database now that even knows who I am. Like if you ask the customer who the owner is, they all point at the CEO. They think the CEO owns it, right? He said, for the last five years, I've just had, I've supported him. I've coached him, right? He's been the guy. Everybody thinks he bought this thing five years ago because they haven't seen me, right? We went through all that. And he, that, that guy wants to stay, right? That guy wants to stay and participate in the PE uplift and stuff, and he's all the different things that happens when they, because they were looking to sell the private equity. He says, but yeah. I knew this guy had some medical issues. He's like, I knew I needed to leave. And yeah. I had to find a, his thing. He had to find a less stressful environment. And yeah. so he, he engineered it. You no, know, when he did his exit, it was, it was like easy. Like they, they were offering golden handcuffs, but it wasn't to him. It was to his two, two of his VPs and they got the earnouts and, and CEO and two VPs got earnouts and stuff because they needed them to stay around. But yeah, he got his check and he got to move to a drier climate and deal with his health. So yeah, it's one of my mentors, be... yeah, one of my mentors, Greg Alexander, definitely he had a phenomenal exit because he has such an efficient management team. Yep. They just wrote him a check and he left. Like there was no, it, it, it can't like, be done. A lot of people don't think you can do it. But <laughs> if you work with somebody like you or somebody out there that knows how, like, what these buyers are looking for and what it takes. It absolutely can be done. You can sell to a PE firm and walk away. You just have to have walked away a long time ago and it still be running on its own. <laughs> That's right. Right? That's right. So. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you sell to a PE firm or you can sell it to a street acquirer. I think street acquirers yeah. can be super fun and viable. Yeah. For a while there, the strategic buyers were paying more. What's the market look like now? Is it still a higher multiple for somebody to start doing a strategic purchase than a PE firm or... Is it just random? It depends on who the buyer is. It depends on what comp what the company is, right? <laughs> and how well they're doing. I think I think we have touched on this a little prior to getting on the show, but I definitely believe that the multiples are not there for companies that are in the middle of the pack, right? Or lower. And you're not get you're not gonna get the high valuation that you would have gotten maybe a year or two ago. People are being very picky about how much money they spend. I think a lot of that access to capital though, right? 
and also the price of debt. <laughs> so I think there's just some major reasons that it's just not going to, you're just not going to get the same bang for your buck. Kind of I've talked is. to in the last six months, I've talked to at least three different advisors that focus on finding deals for PE. That's what their advisory is. They find deals for PE. Oh, yeah. And all of them are switching over. I've heard out of the three or four I've talked to, it's like DSOs, dental service organizations, MSOs, medical service organizations. So they're buying medical offices, dentist's offices, veterinarian offices. And I was like, it just shows they're turning to safe money, recession proof type of stuff. They're safer bets. High, those things are all high profit. Uh, and someone's always going to be sick, right? Yeah, somebody's always going to be sick. You're always going to take care of your animals. As a matter of fact, the funny thing is when the economy dumps, like when we hit COVID, yeah. more animals yeah. and more pets were about more, almost three times the number of dogs were adopted during COVID than any other time in history, right? People are sick at oh, home sure. alone and they're, they wanted a companion. So uh, you want companionship when you don't feel well. So, so when the economy's down, I think that the pet, the veterinarian services and the products around it. So that wasn't just a, that guy wasn't just doing like veterinarian services. They were doing anything pet related inside of that space. So they were like, buying. For example, I, didn't, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is, but something about dog fresh food is like really hot right now. You, I didn't I know. You reading about this, like farm to table I, for dogs. Yeah, there is farm to table. It's crazy. What I didn't know there was is like there's medical devices, like me medical device companies. There's yeah. veterinary device companies. There's companies that make devices for animal, like the same way you would have a heart monitor for us. There's a particular type of leads and stuff they need for animals and stuff. And so this guy was the one of the guys that they had their veterinarian service roll up. They were looking for medical device providers and resellers and stuff too. That you know, because they they were buying all these. They were buying quite a few veterinarian clinics. So why not buy out one of the suppliers that supplies the devices to all of them, right? Or so yeah, it was interesting, but. My my whole family is we're animal lovers, right? My little daughter is really yeah. she's my daughter's seven, and uh, she'd walk up and hug the grizzly bear if you didn't stop her, right? She's just not afraid of animals. I've seen dogs growling at her, like ears laid back, tail tucked, growling at her, and she's wanting to hug them. I'm like, no, honey, you can't do that. Well, that, that may said, serve her later on in life, though, too. Like, yeah, you ask her what she wants to be now, and she's going to be a veterinarian. Oh. You ask my Go seven year old what she's going to do when she grows up, she'll tell you, I'm going to I'm going to take care of animals, right? Oh, so great. And so. I don't want to ever see that fade away. So, but yeah, it's interesting that this whole topic came up because what are the valuations looking right now? The valuations right now, what I've seen and what you're talking about, they're leaning towards safe money. So if you're a top tier, you've got great operations, your systems and processes are down. You've got great recurring revenue. As we say, recurring revenue. Yep. Yeah. You got great, a steady, good contracts on top of your great kind of revenue. So your people are contracted in with you. So they just can't leave. I mean, you're not, it's not a song <laughs> management team. Like if you're an A player, I still think the valuations are up there. I think they're getting the same or close to the same That's valuations right. before. The second you put in chink in your armor, those valuations drop. And like That's I said, right. the, P, the, the buyers right now are looking for safer bets. And uh, That's right. there's still, a lot of people understand that money didn't go anywhere, right? That dry powder is still there. Like there are trillions of dollars sitting there that need to be deployed. The trick is two things is happening in this market, right? If they don't deploy it, they can lose it because of the way their contracts are written. When they when you raise funds in an equity fund, you got so much time to to deploy yeah. and you're, you're, the, the investors expect a return on investment within a per period of time. So there is some pressure for them to do something. And there's some, they're supposed to win. So now they're stuck in this game where I got to deploy it, but I'm going to win. So they're just looking for the safest bet possible. They're going to take these less, these less risks because within a down economy and you're a medium run company, you know, you, you got chinks in your armor. If the economy goes any first, further down the, down the drain than it already, people think it already is, you're 10 times the risk than you were if, you know, if yeah, everything was iron ironclad. Right. To a certain yeah. extent, right? Because keep in mind that there's not the multiple offers that you're, the sellers aren't seeing that multiple offers unless they are the A players. Which is why probably price is pretty competitive for them. But that's a lot of what it is also. Because yep. a lot of the individual buyers may not be turned on to want to work with them or a lot of the maybe smaller companies that would be buying may not may choose to not buy right now. All sorts of things. And then in, in this small realm, this below $5 million, that's one thing. The SBA made some really cool changes here recently where they're letting partial purchase and some other stuff. I really think they need to double or triple their their lending power. So like for yes. only doing 5 million, it should be 10. <laughs> it should be, I honestly think it should be 10 or 15. 
be honest, it should stay right under the radar of whether the PE firms are picking up because there's a dead space in the market right now. There's a, yeah. a, a what I call that a dead space, but basically SBA will go up to five million. PE will only dip in, and the strategic buyers typically don't want to deliver. But depending on the industry, most industries it's under twenty five. They, they want a valuation yeah. twenty five million and above. But some of them are fifty million and above. So you got this whole space in there that kind of a no man's land that you somebody has to have cash or lenders lined up, investment banks and stuff lined up to to pull that off. I think the and to be honest. All it is a government guarantee. Anyway, everything since SBA loans, for those of you who are new in this space, they're not loaning, the government's not loaning anybody any money whatsoever. All they're doing yeah. is guarantee, guaranteeing up to 75%. If you follow the rules and their guidelines, they'll pay, and the buyer defaults on the business that's acquired, they'll pay you back 75% of that, the value that you loaned, right? Yeah. So maybe, I think even if they did something where they did 75% at 5 million and did 60% or some percentage of, 10 million and, the next 10 right yeah and tiered yeah. it up i honestly i tried to get them on here to be honest i tried i've reached out four or five times to <laughs> somebody from the s yeah uh, like the higher ups. i, I actually One, would love to he- i would love to hear that conversation yeah. just to talk to the people that make the rules and stuff try to get them on here and i'll keep doing it i'll have my team keep reaching out to them eventually they'll say yes or they'll tell me go away but uh, they sent me to the pr team last time the pr like tried to send me to some guy like who does like talking about like you know what exists already I was like, that's not the show I want. So I didn't have him on here. I like, I've got a lot of, give, experts yeah, come on. Give me your, yeah. what are you changing? <laughs> yeah. What do you bring? How are you making yeah. this in the 2000s? Yeah. What are you considering? Right. What are the options on the yeah. table? You don't have to tell us that you're going to do something or not do something, but what's even in their consideration. Right. That's right. And then let me do my thing where I can throw some ideas in there, stir that stuff up in your head a little bit. Cause I'm good at that. <laughs> right. I want to instigate some trouble here is what I want to do. So. Let's talk a more about your company, what yeah. you specialized in. We, I don't think we actually did your target demographics. Are you tech companies, uh, brick and mortar? What is your favorite thing to work with? So I love, yes, I love big tech companies. I love professional services companies, med, med tech, fintech. Also, I will work with a lot with consumer products companies as well. Definitely. Yeah. I've been really enjoying lately. I've been really enjoying professional service companies and tech companies. So that's my jam. So professional service companies, that's like financial consultants, other big consultancies or that could be uh, consultancies, CPA firms, like marketing. Yep. CPA firms. Yeah. yeah that's kind of what that is. That's really so cool. And, like more of the B2B business services or organizations. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And then you said anywhere in California, right? Yep. So again, so I have clients that are in Northern California, I have clients that are in Southern California. So definitely on that, we're looking to get a little bit deeper, as I mentioned, in, in LA County. So if you have LA County listeners, please reach out. But absolutely, we're very excited to work with people in California. Just I, after being global for so long, it's nice to be in right. the same time zone. Right, we, we, right. Yeah, I get that. It's like, oh, this is kind of nice. Yeah, I I host meetings every twice a month for anybody in the M&A space. So we hang out and kind of a hangout networking thing. And we have people from all over, from Dubai and South Africa yeah. and you name it, we got them in there. And the, the, the it's really interesting. A lot of the same things apply, but a lot of the, yeah. the cultures are different, right? A lot of the rules are different in some of these places. So I love actually... I like the international side of it, but I, like I would only buy something here right now. Somebody's trying to sell me a international a is really hard. Yeah, Internet somebody's actually sell, trying to sell a sell me a a blog right now that's doing really well, but it's in French and I don't know how to read French at all. So it's like, okay, sorry, it's not within my thing. It's all their customers are French. Yeah. You know, like I, I don't think I learn learn French fluently enough to make sure I continue to provide great content. So I believe in playing within your own ball field. All right, knowing what you know. That's why I was asking, what do you specialize in? What do you like? Right. So the next question I have in what do you like? Are you looking for companies that want to exit in a year, three years, want to double in size, triple in size? What do you what do you really want to help these guys accomplish? So there's three things that we focus on. One being the grow before you sell program, which mm-hmm. is focus on again, someone who wants to sell within the next three to five years and they want to nest, and they want to consider acquisitions in order to do that. So that's one type of customer that we're looking for. I think also a company that just, they're ready to sell. They don't know if they're ready yet, but they are ready to sell. Like just mentally they're there. So the question is, how do we help them get ready to sell 
And then how do we actually help them with the process? And then the third is for a company that is looking for assistance with their due diligence or integration or something along those lines. And that's something that we do as well. So those are the three different things that we look at. Another piece too, just within that is always divestitures. And that can fall in any bit of any one of those three categories. And from a divestor standpoint, definitely we help out. We guide for the TSAs that you want to have, transaction services agreements. We'd also work with you in terms of what the separation process might look like, et cetera. Yeah. I don't know a lot of people that specialize in divestors. I've, inter- I've tried mm-hmm. to try to really learn this space, right? Because I think there's some really great deals to be had. Um mm-hmm acquiring divestors from tech companies and stuff where they they bought a big company and that big company had this little side project that's doing five or ten million dollars that they don't really care about and they just shut it down it happens a lot of times they just shut them down and i've always wondered like i talked to a guy that we had him on here on the show he buys fairly large computer security companies all through divestors i asked him well how do you find your deals and he's like i know all the product uh, product managers at all the big companies right like He's networked and made friends with and everybody from the Googles to, you know, all these big tech companies, the product managers know that he buys security companies and if they're going to shut a division down or stuff like that, they should probably talk to him. Right. And they bring him deals. I was like, there's got to be another way than like going to all the trade shows, figure out who the product manager is for all the companies that would ever acquire a company that might be something I'm interested in. Like, how do you do the cold outreach to the, I guess... I guess you could find a list of product managers. Well, half the game is showing up, right? It's just being, it's making sure that you are visible to the point where someone can see you and say, oh yeah, I forgot. That's what I need. Right. And I think that's part of it. The the other half though, is to your point, just the regular emails. I know that it's weird because there's people that reach out to me and I say, you know what? That'd be good for something down the line. Like Mm -hmm. let's continue to keep the lines of communication open. And then sometimes they reach back out like in three months or six months time and something is, it's there for the right moment, right? Yep. So you always have to make sure that you're nurturing people that yep. are in your network or that you've created relationships with. That's just such a key piece of the game. It's really like when you were talking about financial services and like in to do that. I was going to save this for after the show, but I'll tell you right now, there's a gentleman that shows up on our once a month or twice a month. He shows up on our networking thing. He's a licensed, certified, what do you call it, CPA, mm-hmm. fractional tra- fractional CFO kind of guy. Yeah. And that's what he's looking to acquire companies that or get do what we call work for equity or do partial acquisitions where he gets in, helps them for a couple of years and helps them get a piece of the equity when he, when they sell. But, oh, but from a CPA, a CFO perspective, he's looking for other stuff like that. So there's guys out there that have the expertise that can like step in. And if you're the CFO or C- CEO or something of a company and you think that you have to ride this thing out until exit, there's guys out there that'll step in and help out for that exit, exit equity. So you could coach them and then they could have somebody else that'll be in there for that, for that role that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is important. I think there's also the other piece too. If you're worried that, that the Bico might want you to stay on it for too long, you can always work with him on doing a simultaneous <laughs> right. ramp up of a fractional C-suite person, right? So yep. happy to stay on for six months to a year, but after that, you have to find your own CEO or. <laughs> yeah, I've been training this guy for six months. He wants to do, he wants to do this for you. That's what made me think of him is like, that's what he wants to do. He wants to step in and work for companies for a few years and have, help them exit. So there's a good opportunity for those guys to have those financial service companies. They want to leave. And they don't want the golden handcuffs to have somebody come in early during this process, during your two or three years of planning, right? Learn the business, help run the business and be part of that golden handcuffs when it leaves and free that owner up. So there's always that opportunity. So let's tell people yeah, how to reach out. Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, I'm not always a huge fan of the earn out. Sorry, I was going to agree with you. I'm just going to agree with you. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. How do people reach out to you? What's the best way to contact you? I know you have a LinkedIn profile. You want them to use that or you want them to? I have a LinkedIn profile. They can search for me. It's Jonathan Wilson. Dub Value Creation is the the name of my company. So D-U-B-B, Value, and then Creation. The other way to get a hold of me is just send a note to Jonathan dot Wilson. That's J O N A T H A N dot Wilson W I L 
S O N at D U B B V A L U E dot com. And I'm pretty responsive. So feel free to may take me a day, but I, I will get back to you via email. Really? You can call our office line too. 424-380-4277. We'll make sure we put that in the show notes for you guys that are driving. Don't swerve over to the side of the road and get a pin. So we'll put that in the show notes for you guys. Last thing we always do before we go, if somebody could remember two, maybe three things from the show today, what would you want them to walk away with? What would you want them to just remember from the show? Please do not rush out and try to sell your company. <laughs> Be prepared for that. Also, engage someone if you're thinking about selling or if you're thinking about buying companies, engage an expert on that. And then the other piece is think about your integration and separation strategy if you're on the, depending on whether or not you're on the buy side or the sell side, but you want to think about what that exit actually looks like. So the good news is that before we cut off here is these down economies only last for a few years. Usually, if you look historically, we're only down for a year or two. So if you're going to come three years sometimes so if they're going to come work with you for two or three years we're already a year and a half into this mess if you count covid we're two and a half three years into this mess so there's a good chance by the time they're ready to really get the max value after you're done helping them out the market's back the numbers are different and there's a good chance that they could see some pretty remarkable differences between now and then i'm 100 with you i definitely think that at some point the interest rates are going to go down so right. they had to go up so they could go down because you can't go lower than zero so now that they're up, it's going to have the ability to have them go down. So I think that's going to happen probably in the next year, year and a half. Yeah. So I'm excited. I'm positive on the market. Awesome. Well, I appreciate having you here. Is there any parting words you want to say before we call it a show? Other than thank you. And I really enjoyed being on here. I mean, you really did enjoy it. This is fun. All right. It's fun. Yeah. Well, I'll hang out for just a second after the show. We'll call that a show, guys. Hey, it's your host, Ronald Skelton. I want to thank you personally for watching the show today and invite you to call our new hotline, 918-641-4150. That's 918-641-4150. Call us and tell us about our show, ask questions, uh, suggest a guest, or even tell me about a business you have for sale and we'll reach back out to you. Again, that number is 918-641-4150. Call our hotline and leave us some information. Thank you. I want to announce our new channel partners, the ITX Marketplace. Since 1998, ITX has created $5 billion in value by selling more than 225 IT businesses in 20 countries. ITX works exclusively with IT-enabled businesses generating between $5 million and $30 million who are ready to be sold and m and to decision makers who are ready to buy. For over 25 years, ITX has developed industry knowledge that helps determine whether a seller is a good fit for their buyers before making the match. ITX Mergers and Acquisition Marketplace, we have partnered with, has a proprietary database of 50,000 plus global buyers seeking IT service firms, managed service providers, Microsoft service providers, software as a service platforms, and channel partners with Microsoft Oracle, ServiceNow, and, self, and, and the Salesforce space. If you have an IT enabled business, you're ready to sell, I want you to visit the IT exchangenet.com slash marketplace how to exit that link will be in the show notes visit them now